He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. Does that include all of us? Or are somebody, or is everybody paid up already? Hallelujah. I'm paid up. Are you? And guess who paid? It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? When I study what Jesus did for us, you, you just reminisce a little bit what he did. And you cannot help but worship him for what he did. His awesome, this awesome creator of the universe. He wants to be with me. He chose to be with me throughout eternity. So he paid the debt for me. Hallelujah. When we watch what's going on all over the world, there is an interesting switch going on. There's going to be people that are going to be turning to God, but there's also going to be people that are going to turn away from God, regardless of the proof that God exists. When you preach the gospel of salvation, when you preach creation, and I listen to the preachers all over, they're all over the world, and it's amazing how people make choices to believe in evolution, to believe in strange gods. I was watching this thing in India. It's unbelievable how, how those people believe in their gods and how they do penance for their gods. They whip themselves, they crawl for hundreds of miles, they roll towards the place where they worship. You go on, go on the internet, go on YouTube, check them out, and it'll amaze you how incredibly deceived those people are. But you know what? Regardless how big the deception is, and regardless how small the deception is, it's still a deception. When you shoot something and you hit the mark dead on, you hit it. But if you just miss it by, the, let's say, a hair, you still miss it. So this is how it's going to be. Those who don't know God, regardless how close they are to him, the Bible teaches us there's God, many going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name? And that, and the Lord will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. There are many people to this, to, today who say they know God. The question is, does Jesus know them? And when we study what's going on, they're getting steeped into religion. When we study the evolution, the atheists, they're becoming more and more convinced there is no God. Why are they convinced? It's not because of the evidence. The evidence speaks otherwise. It's because of the spirit that is within them, that is talking to them, completely blinding their eyes, stopping their ears so they don't hear. The Bible teaches us that their ears are stopped. They hear, but they don't hear. They see, but they don't see. Isn't that interesting? Are our ears open to what Scripture is talking, to, is speaking? We are definitely in an ex exciting time. We see something happening in south, uh, down south across the border. We're going to be uh, allowing, when is it, when we're going to be able to smoke marijuana? Next week, next month. Don't take it down south, they'll lock you up. Don't take it here either, because you're going to fry your brains. So God is, is setting things up. And we're going to see amazing things happening. Signs and wonders. Unbelievable signs and wonders. Remember that hurricane that went in 
that came in offshore. It's a category four. So I was watching Pat Robinson on the 700 Club. That was a week, almost a week before that thing came in. And he said, it's heading right for where they are. But we are getting a whole big team of prayer warriors together. We're going to pray against it that God will change it or throw it back or do something. And guess what? There's a strange, when it came closer to land, there was a strange twist in the southern direction, which nobody can explain. I can explain it. People prayed. People stood in the gap. People dared to believe God. That God said, you, I have given to you this world. Now, make sure you are good stewards of it. Most of us, most of the world has forgotten that. So here's what we see. Terrible drenching rains, people getting killed. And how much can we pray for? Why are our prayers hindered? With the millions of babies being killed, by our tax dollars. That's what's hindering prayers. With the terrible deception in our governments and the corruption, that's why our prayers are being hindered. One of these days, God will say, this is enough. And we will then be taken out. So let's hold back the evil at least till the rapture. The time for the rapture is set. For those who don't believe in the rapture, well, you're missing out on something that's awesome. The time of the rapture is set. It's a day that God knows. But we can keep back the evil until that time. And according to scripture, that's what's going to happen. So we're going to see some interesting stuff happening in the next few years. I wish Jesus would come back. Now he says, look for my appearing. Look for it. And today I will teach on an interesting subject about what's taking place in heaven just after the church age and just before the tribulation begins. I want you to study it at home. It's, it's Revelations chapter 4 and 5. Incredible stuff in there. So before we get into this, let's rise and ask the Lord for blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. I ask you, Lord, that you will anoint this message. You will open our hearts to the simple truth of it and what we are going to see in the very near future. I thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who have studied the Word of God need to, uh, need to look at Titus chapter 2 in verse 13. It says, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So God is commanding us or telling us to, to anticipate that blessed hope. How many here anticipate Jesus coming back? How many over the internet anticipate Jesus coming back? How many are looking forward, forward to it? Or are they saying, Lord, wait a little longer, sweet Jesus. I need to try my new car. Wait a little longer, sweet Jesus. I still got this house that I want to buy. Wait a little longer, sweet Jesus. I want to take this holiday. On and on the excuses go for Jesus not coming back. Look at it. Look at it this way. If Jesus comes back, you'll have the best house, the best holiday, the best time on the planet. So forget about this garbage that we call pleasure here. Let's look forward to the soon coming of Christ. Now, Revelations chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2. After God is finished telling the Apostle John about the church. 
admonishing the church in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. He's admonishing the church, telling them what to do. Once he's finished with the church, and I take this as once the church is, her age is finished, then God will say to us, come up hither. Like he said to John, come up hither in chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show these things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. So that's John see something very interestingly. A throne right as he got there in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6 and before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal I want you to pay attention to this sea of glass a wide open expanse a sea of glass and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of ice before and behind I've never seen a creature like that, so I don't know what it looked like. Anyways, I know it has eyes in the front and eyes in the back. It must not be that nice to look at with our eyes, but once we'll get some new eyes and once that'll see truth and, and, and the reality of things, then we'll see what God has. So we see the sea of glass, the crystal. We see the four beasts, and there's the four and twenty elders around the throne also. And then it says in Revelation chapter 5, we'll go to chapter 5 in verse 1 and 2. And I saw, there's the throne, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loosen the seals thereof? So, who starts the tribulation? Is it the Antichrist? Not necessarily. He's just a tool that God will use. So here's this book with seals, seven seals. And then... It says in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, and, by, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the, of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto the old earth. And he came and took the book, out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Listen to this one. How many of you believe in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? I do. But there are churches out there that don't preach that. They say this is not true. There's only Jesus. And I people who I know people who go to those churches. And I had my share of arguments with them. And when you show them these things, they don't quite know what to make of it. The lamb went up to the throne. Who is the lamb? The lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes up to the throne and he takes the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. So there's the father, and there's the Son, hallelujah. We got them there. So don't try to even argue with people. Just show them the scripture. Let them argue with the scripture because you, they'll argue till you're blue in the face, but with scripture, they cannot, they just say, well, that maybe means something else, but they know, they see it as it is written. So it says here, that the, the, the lamb takes the book. 
And listen to this, Revelation chapter 5, 11. And, by, and I beheld, and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, and round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the numbers of them were 10,000 times, 10,000s of thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. For those of you who were here last week, I was teaching how the Lamb opened the first seal and how it opened the second seal. And that started off the tribulation. And when you go to chapter 6, you can see the guy on the white horse riding out, bringing peace to this world. It's going to be interesting that the Antichrist will start off the tribulation by causing craft to prosper. What does that mean? Things will start to boom. That is found written in the book of Daniel in chapter 2, I believe it is, or in chapter 9, where things will start to really move ahead. But here we are in heaven just before the tribulation. Listen to this one. All of a sudden, he sees many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number that were ten thousands times ten thousands of thousands. Did you remember that when John comes into heaven, he sees a sea of glass. Now all of a sudden, there are millions of people filling this sea of glass. Who are those people? Can we identify them? I will take you to a scripture found in Revelation chapter 5 in verse 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests which shall reign on the earth. So can we identify all those millions of people that suddenly appear, remember, before the seals are opened, suddenly appear on the sea of glass. They're singing a song. What are they singing? You have redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred tongue and people. There, what I can see here, we got some Mennonites, we got some Hutterites, we got some people from, where is that country? It's the Philippines. We're covering a few of the kindreds and tongues. Yesterday, the other day, I talked to a lady from Africa who loves the Lord. Think about it. Who are those people that suddenly appear around the throne of God, filling the sea of glass? They are the church of Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Not only are they born again by the Spirit of God, not only are they washed by the blood of the Lamb, they are also kings and priests unto God. Interesting that God calls us the church, his kings and priests. So we are the ones that suddenly will appear around the throne just before the great tribulation kicks into gear. That's going to be very, very interesting. I'm going to have a ringside seat of watching the Antichrist just starting to wreak havoc on this earth. And not only that, Satan and his angels will be brought down to this earth. And the Bible teaches us a hole will open up and the demonic realm will pour out. 
those who have been bound for ages will be loosened and let out on this planet. I've talked to people who said during the tribulation, we will shine as ministers of God. And I'm thinking to myself, the only thing that will shine is the sword that's going to kill, uh, that's going to take off your head. Because during the tribulation, there's going to be 144,000 who are going to be preaching the word of God. And they are all be of Jewish descent. They're Jewish people from the 12 tribes of Israel. Who is going to be here? Where are we going to be? The Bible teaches us that the, that the, the devil, the, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. What will happen during the tribulation? The Antichrist will prevail against the saints. So it is impossible that we, the church, who have been given the power to, to uh, control this earth will be here during that time. So God is telling us here, get ready. We're going to start seeing something that this world has never seen or ever will see again. Can you imagine Satan walking around on this earth physically? Can you imagine demons walking around on this earth physical, in a physical form. The fallen angels will be here in a physical form. Are they here already? Demons are, that I know for a fact. What is happening in the world today? I was watching Fox News as they were showing, a pilot was showing a videotape. He took himself there was an unidentified flying object right out his window. And everybody was proclaiming, we're getting some intelligence from different planets to come to tell us what we do, what we're supposed to do. It's signs and wonders. It's deception. God, the Bible teaches us, God will send them a deception that they will believe a lie because they have no love for the truth. I know what these things are. I've known it since I was a Christian. I remember when I was about 16, the UFO deal started. It was all over the papers. People were starting to see things. They were starting to, to, to talk about these things. And, and nobody could figure out what it was. And I figured, well, whatever it is, it doesn't matter to me. I'm enjoying myself. I got my booze. I got my gun. We'll take care of it when they come. So when I became a Christian, I started to realize these things are demonic beings. Because you cannot read of any intelligence in the universe except for planet earth, heaven, and hell. That's the only intelligence there is. And I believe the intelligence from hell are starting to make themselves known. Why? Because the world system is welcoming them. Have you ever heard of the, in the artificial intelligence that they're starting to produce? It's unbelievable what's happening. They are starting to intermingle humans with animals. We're seeing all of that stuff. If you want to look for it, go, go and search it out. People that are credible are becoming Christians and telling us these things. We better be sure Jesus is about to come back to luck things down. Do you remember when you could eat a piece of bread without being afraid you're going to be over 300 pounds in a week? I remember that time. We ate bread every day and nobody had a problem with it. Today if you eat a slice of toast, oh you're going to be obese in a week. 
You know what's happened to our grain? They have manipulated it. So it's destroying us instead of sending us nourishment. You can, that's a whole nother thing to get in. But God is telling us, we're closing this down. Why? Because they have corrupted the earth to a point where he has to. Now listen to the Revelations chapter 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's another subject, reigning with him a thousand years. We are priests to our God and we are part of that first resurrection. We have been raised from the dead. How? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. When we were born again, that's being raised from the dead. Not only are we being raised from the dead, one day we'll be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be changed. You cannot go to heaven unless you have a new body. Because this physical body, as soon as it gets close to the Holy Spirit, our God, it starts to vibrate apart. It cannot take the power. We need a new body. And it says, blessed are those who have taken part in that first resurrection. Hallelujah. So I got a question for all of us today. Have we taken part in that first resurrection? When you go to confess your sins, I had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine or a relative of mine. We were talking about confessing our sins. I told him, when you do wrong to my wife, do you go and apologize to her or to me? Well, to her. Well, I said, when you sin against God, who do you confess your sin to? I told him, the Bible declares the curtain has been ripped down. The, the priest has been put aside. Now we can go in and confess our sins to the one who we have sinned against. The psalmist said, against you, O God, have I sinned, against you alone. So it is between us and God, nobody else, to where we go and pour out our hearts to. Jesus made it so easy for us if we would only take that time and take that pardon that he's offering us. Against me you have sinned, not against anybody else. He is God. He is the creator. You go to him to confess your sin. And the Bible teaches us, those that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Do you have doubts in your mind that somehow Jesus may have missed one little sin in your background that you committed? It's eaten at you for the last maybe 20 years. Something I don't dare tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Tell it to Jesus. He took care of that one too, regardless of how horrible it is. Because it, you sinned against him. He is your creator. So God wants us to understand that. And those that come to him, he will definitely cleanse and make them pure and holy and righteous. I was talking to a friend of mine a week ago, a couple of days ago, about salvation. Once saved and always saved. I told him, listen, you don't preach that as a doctrine because I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're once saved and always saved. But one thing I do know, I am. How do I know? Because the Holy Ghost 
has implanted it into my heart. I know he will never leave me nor forsake me. And for sure, I will hang on to him with all I got because he's all I got. I don't need any more. So Jesus is calling us. Come on to me. All you that are laboring and are heavily laden, I somehow feel I'm talking to a person right now who just can't get over something that he did years ago. You just need to let it go. Give it to Jesus. Forget about it. He cleansed it. It is as if it's never been there. The Bible teaches us he puts our sins as far away from us as the east is from the west. Why did he use the east as from the west? Because the north and the south has a connection. You can reach them. You can reach the north pole and you can reach the south pole. But you cannot reach a point when you go east and west. Very interesting how the Bible uses terminology. So if you're here and there's something in you that keeps bugging you, just give it to Jesus. He wants you to throw it behind you and forget about it because he's the one that cleanses you from all unrighteousness. So we need to open our heart to this. He is coming back soon, very soon, and we want to be ready for him. Let's open our hearts to him. Get rid of all the dross. How do we do it? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. He washes us and then the regeneration starts in your heart. We have a relationship with this God and he will in no wise cast us out because he loves us. So let the Lord open your heart to this and make you a blessing. Amen.